This is Duke University. Cool. So, thanks. Um, so yeah, I just want to introduce Jay Jamison now. Uh, so we're fortunate to have Jay with us today, and you know, thanks for spending time with us. Uh, Jay traveled all the way from California. Um, he's a partner at Blue Run Ventures. Duke undergrad, uh, got his MBA at Wharton, um, spent several years at Microsoft, um, started his own company, and uh, then made the trek all the way to Silicon Valley, and um, now he's a venture capitalist. So uh, I think, uh, you know, we'd like to hear more about uh, your story, and uh, yeah, Great. thanks a lot. Awesome, thanks a lot. Um, thank you guys for having me, and it's awesome to be back at Duke. Um, just in terms of ground rules, because I know I speak at schools a lot, what time do you guys need to be done? 115? Okay, I move fast. The other ground rule I have is um, I'm a free marketeer capitalist. So if what I'm saying isn't interesting and you want to look at Facebook or whatever else might be on your computer, <laughs> feel free. I've got to I've got to supply something that you guys demand. If I don't, I, I take my licks like the rest of them. All right. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do is talk about sort of startup lessons learned, um, both in terms of company foundation as well as sort of things that I see in the venture world. I'll talk a little bit about sort of entrepreneurship broadly, and then I'll try and apply it actually a little bit to what you might be studying or what might be relevant in terms of a legal career and some of the stuff you're studying. So I'll introduce myself briefly. I'll go through what I call my top 10 lessons, and then I'll do Q&A. Given that we have about 50 minutes, I'm going to talk fast, which I, I generally do, um, and I'll try and get to Q&A. I also find that helps minimize people. Um, not finding me irrelevant to talk about. So this is a little bit about me. I actually graduated from Duke with a BA, went to law school for a year with the vision of doing an, a JD MBA, went to Emory, and really liked law school, but then, then got the opportunity to go to Wharton. And when I went to, although I really liked law school, business school I found way more fun and interesting. So it was very shortly after that that I decided I wanted to get into business. Um, no disrespect, I did find I did find law the probably that first year of law school the most intellectually stimulated and interesting year I spent in education in my entire life. So it was great. But got my MBA, then went to Microsoft. I founded a company called Moonshoot, which is based in Asia, still going. We've raised about nine million dollars. Its vision is to help any child on earth learn English as a foreign language using a variety of social games and education pedagogy. Launched in Japan and China earlier this year, and then. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I joined Blue Run Ventures and have made five investments. You can see these. Thumb is one of them. It was uh, not captured in my bill, but Food Spotting, which is a social network for it tells you what dishes are good and interesting to eat nearby. It's kind of a competitor to Yelp. App Central is a mobile enterprise uh, software company. App Redeem is a mobile uh, ad company that's doing extremely well. And Eggdrop is a mobile version, basically of. Craigslist or eBay, a very simple way to use your mobile phone to sell anything you want to sell. This is a little bit about Blue Run Ventures. We are a early stage venture capital firm. We've been in business for about 13 years. We have a little bit over a bill. We have about $1.2 billion under management. We're investing out of our fourth fund, which is a $240 million fund. Um, we invest in the United States out of Menlo Park. Um, we invest in Be Beijing and China, and we invest in Seoul, Korea. Um, we focus principally on seed and series A. Two core focuses ultimately um, would be sort of the, the things that we do, I think, extremely well. One is a set of what we think of as e-commerce enablers. So PayPal was one of our very first investments. Obviously, uh, did real well with that. More recently, we've gotten into alternative e-commerce platforms. Cabbage is an early stage company down in Atlanta that's growing very, very quickly in the e-commerce space. And Pavement is the largest integrated shopping cart platform within Facebook. So that's sort of one vector. And then the other vector is basically mobile. So food spotting, Waze, Banjo, Quicks, Chomp, those are all mobile companies that we have uh, helped get off the ground. So um, having been somebody that went to business school and who did some law like there's a, and who worked at Microsoft and then moved to Silicon Valley, there was a bunch of stuff that surprised me about entrepreneurship and building credibility within the Valley. The first one was that having worked at Microsoft for 10 years, I figured I'd show up and people would be like, wow, that's really relevant, useful experience to have in high technology. And it turned out that in Silicon Valley, that was like basically irrelevant. 
it was, if anything, it was like slightly negative because their view was you've worked at a big company that's always, that's never had less than $40 billion of cash on its balance sheet. What can you know about something like making payroll or actually having to build a company from scratch? Um, having an MBA from Wharton basically mattered even less. And I give this talk at Wharton all the time, and it really got at people feeling like, well, you're going to like want to travel first class everywhere and stay at Ritz-Carlton's. You're not going to understand what it's like to build a company where people are sleeping on air mattresses and eating ramen noodles. You're not going to be close, to, you're, and you're not going to be able to code anything of any usefulness. So real strong negative biases towards towards that. Having had a, law, a year of law school like was like – Probably, honestly, not something I ever mentioned to anyone. <laughs> and, um, but I will say several of these skills really helped. So one of the things that I often tell startups is, you know, having worked at Microsoft for 10 years, when I did a product launch, that product launch was like on CNBC as a breaking alert. Like we'd get interviewed in the Wall Street Journal. Um, I could do demos in front of, you know, 5,000 people. I, I was... Well, I worked in Japan for four years and was interviewed for an hour on the equivalent of 60 minutes, which turned out to be like a Japanese, it was a total investigative reporting. I was positioned as this like really evil guy. It was horrible. <laughs> but the basic point is like that was, that gives you a sense of when you're two people in a garage, the idea of what it's going to take to scale a company to being massive, it's, you have no, con no context for what that's like. Working at Microsoft gives you that context. At Wharton, and to a degree, law school gives you a set of analytic skills and abilities to drill into, hey, what are, you know, what's really the situation or in law, the fact pattern, what's the court issue, and you know, what would you recommend you actually make, go make happen? This sort of stuff does actually help, but you have to really blast through people's preconceived notions that if you're not like a super high-end computer science electrical engineer graduate from MIT, you're not like in the club. You've got to fight through that, that prejudice. All right, let's see here. Sorry for the weird builds. So I generally go through the top 10 startup lessons. I've added a couple more. I should sort of update my numbering. But it basically is these I'll go through real quick. These are sort of lessons that I've picked up along the way. Um, I often get asked not just about startup lessons learned, but also like how do I get into a career in venture capital? That's often interesting. And then I thought as a special sort of bonus pack for this group, I'd talk a little bit about sort of what might be relevant in terms of legal you know, as you think about your career, what does a law school uh, degree and experience have that's relevant out in terms of what I do? So let me jump in. So lesson one, this I talk to people all the time about with respect to starting companies. Um, I talk a lot about it. it's a golden age to be a founder. And what that means is you have never had more leverage when you go in to negotiate money from someone like me to say, look, I probably don't really need your money at this point. And so if I'm going to take it, I'm going to get it on terms that I really like. So that's really powerful for founders because five or 10 years ago, founders would have to come in on bended knee and sort of say, look, it's going to cost me 500000 to $5 million just to get this company going. I need to get this money to have my idea have any chance of seeing the light of day. Well, in today's world, what used to cost 500000 to $5 million now costs between $5,000 and $50,000. So you have people that are able to bootstrap money, um, live on credit cards for a few months, build a company um, more cheaply than ever. And given that, they're able to showcase traction. They're able to showcase customers. Um, App Redeem, one of my companies, came in last summer with the most crummy-looking product you've ever seen. But what they had was $50,000 in revenue a month. Just two guys hacked together this thing. It made it very powerful for them in terms of we think we could raise money for this. We think we should. We've got enough money coming in that we can fund it ourselves, so we want to find the right partner. Very, very powerful sort of shift in the equation for founders. Um, in addition to it being cheaper than ever to start a company, there are better resources. More information has been open sourced in the last five years around how to start a company, what's most important, how to negotiate term sheets, what terms are important, and whether it's incubators like Y Combinator or 500 Startups or resources like the Founder Institute or Founders um, list or lean startup or any of these things are resources that are easily found, they're freely available, and they teach you a ton about what's most important and how as a founder to drive the most value in the deals you want to cut with uh, venture folks. 
And then finally, technology is easier to learn and access than it's ever been before. So whether it's a self-teaching modules in Codecademy or uh, the freely available Ruby on Rails or the very cheaply available Amazon Web Services, getting a company up and running uh, and getting something onto the internet and working is something you can do very, very cheaply, very quickly, and without uh, a ton of training or background in it. So that's great, right? But the flip side to it that you often have to remind entrepreneurs about is investors are smart enough to have figured all the stuff that I just talked out about out. And you see a stack rank of, you see a bell curve of companies that come through and more and more companies are coming in and they're saying, look, I know what I need to do uh, because I've been in market and I've built this company. I'm very capital efficient, very low burn. I've got high velocity in terms of building out code and getting it released. I've got a product that already has customers that love it. Um, I understand what works, I understand what doesn't, and the team has been through ups and downs and we know, we know what we're doing. So as a result, what we're asking for in terms of the money we want is very clear and concrete. So that's very different. Five years ago, people could come in and say, well, I'm not really sure what the team's going to look like. I'm not really sure how much it's going to cost to build the product. I'm not really sure what customers want. That's all changed. And so the implication of this, in my mind, is there's this... Um, conundrum, which is it's a golden age for founders. Founders have more leverage than they've ever had. But at the same time, founders need to accomplish a whole lot more than they have in the past because coming in with a PowerPoint and saying, hey, I've got this great business plan, this idea. And I say, well, where's the demo or where's your product traction? You say, well, I'm going to get money first. That's a really hard bar to climb in this day and age because I can just wait for the next guy to come in who will say, let me show you this killer product and let me show you all my users and let me show you how much money we're making. Um, people can prove a lot on very little, so the bar is raised, and I find that many founders need to do the same to, to be able to be sort of on par. That's lesson number one. All right, lesson number two. Um, so this is, um, this is a quick multiple choice question. Um, if you had one of these three things to stack rank in your company, if you had a great market, a great product, or a great team, which one of them would you have at the expense of the other two? So raise your hand if you think it's great market. Okay. Raise your hand if you think it's great product. Okay. It's everybody, team, right? Okay. Everybody talks about team. And I'm not about to denigrate the importance of teams. Teams are super important. But I'm going to say, to me, I view things differently. And the reason I view things differently is great markets can make bad teams look great. So in other words, you know, I, I use thought examples on this all the time. This is more relevant for, I don't want to sort of denigrate this team, but I will denigrate their product. Craigslist. Craigslist is a product everybody knows, everybody uses, has almost insurmountable entry barriers at this point. Um, the pro Name me someone who can say it's an awesome product. It's, it hasn't innovated in 15 years. It's mobile experience is crappy. It's, it, it, you know, you have a bunch of spammy people. People have gotten killed through the thing. It's a terrible, terrible product. <laughs> so, and I think that's a reflection. I bluntly think that's a reflection in some level on the team. But to a degree, it didn't matter. The market size of classified ads was such a big and huge and important market that the guys that sort of found it first and sort of exploited it, you know, quickly won that market. The market trumped the quality of the product and the quality of the team. Um, you, and you can see example after example, if you sort of dig in, of companies where you'd say, look, this was a really, really smart, wicked smart team went after this market that just customers didn't care what they were doing. And I see this all the time in startups. You'll sort of see, oh, wow, this really awesome company, this really awesome team called Color, you know, rock star group, $42 million before they'd shipped anything. And they built something that basically, you know, the CEO admitted, you know, I'd never looked at Facebook. I never used it. I just built a product that was kind of somewhat similar, but didn't quite work. Market was already sewn up. He was, an, you know, I mean, that was an idiotic waste of money. Um, so to me, when you look at big markets, and this is where I spend my time thinking about it, I say to myself, geez, great markets are ones that if you can hit those, those are the ones that will trump bad product, bad team. If you're a great team and you go into a bad market, you better be able to figure out how to get into a good market real quick. And so to me, market's great. Products can always be changed. I mean, it's only software. You just throw it out and rewrite it. Teams, in a sense, can be easier to change than markets. This actually, I actually analyzed this. This is a summary of it. I go through my, every pitch I see during a quarter, anybody I meet with for more than 20 minutes, 
and I sort of score them at the end on basically these four points, um, market team, traction, product. And um, the analysis comes out to basically between one and two, zero and two of the 75 get to a term sheet with us. You score each of them and then you run a multiple regression and say, okay, which of these four things scored the highest? And um, market scores the highest. It's like double the importance of team, triple the importance of traction, quadruple the importance of product. Um, so some numbers that back up kind of at least my biases. So how I think about markets, I basically think about, okay, choose any four companies and write down in five words what they do. You know, and those like before you knew that these companies all were successful and made a lot of money and were public and it changed the world, you would kind of say, okay, that vision, world's largest store, is it's a pretty big vision. If you accomplish that, that would be something that would be good to own or good to work at or whatever you'd call it. Reinventing money. That that'd be a that's a big, big concept, big area. And then you just sort of say, okay, I want to do group photo sharing for weddings, you know, which is a pitch I hear about every month. You're just kind of like, okay, even if you achieved that, you're never going to be like these guys. So stop. Do something big. <laughs> All right. So lesson three, talking about hiring technical co-founders. I, I generally talk about hiring co-founders broadly. Like if you're a technical guy, what does it take to hire a business co-founder? But because it's a law group, I figure that it'd be more on the business side or law side than on the technical. Um, if you're someone that's trying to start a company or you're advising someone who is, and they want to go fundraise and they don't have a technical co-founder, I would tell them, go do this before you do anything else. Because um, as an investor, you're looking at, okay, you may have a really interesting and good idea, but is there someone in this team who knows how to actually build it and get something delivered? Because having something delivered is so much vastly more important than having an idea that um, without it, you're kind of nowhere. Um, it requires very same skill, very very important skills that you'd have as a, as a founder, as a business leader, which is, can you sell the, can you sell the technical co-founder on your vision? Can you be technical enough that they don't think you're, a, you know, that you're not an idiot. They want to work for somebody that is at least geeky enough that they can relate to. And you got to show resourcefulness. Generally, if you're a, a founder or advising a founder, they don't have a lot of money. They don't have a, a lot of product built because otherwise they wouldn't need a technical co-founder. So you've got to be able to convince with as much smoke and mirrors as you can to a technical co-founder that, look, you're a credible, um, important partner that can impart all the sort of elements of doing the job, which is basically anything that's not coding that he or she would want to sign up to, to partner with you on. The other piece to this that I talk about it is um, how to think about and how to advise people on splitting up the equity of a company when you've got like two or three people in a founding team. And um, my default split is to say, you know, if you've got two, you know, like take the number of founders and put that in the denominator, like, you know, you just divide it up. One divided by N and N equals number of founders. If four, then everybody gets 25%. If it's three, it's 33% and so on. Um, and here's why. Um, I see founders that'll say, well, hey, I kicked in, it was my idea, so I should get more. Or... I kicked in $5,000 to buy, you know, the first couple of months of Amazon Web Services servers. And all that's true and all that's interesting and important. But the thing that's really important is thinking about sort of what happens over time. And the way I think about it is this. There are basically two scenarios that founders need to think about. Scenario one, which you should spend little time thinking about, is the scenario where everyone gets rich and the company goes bananas and you sort of put a product out there, product grows, company gets bought and everybody gets rich. And then the question is, okay, if you've got 60% and he's got 40%, you know, great, you made more money and that's fine and whatever. But if you each had 50%, you'd both be doing fine as well. That's actually a scenario that no one should really care about in my view. In my view, the much more likely and common scenario that you need to be protecting for is what happens when things are going badly. And you've got to convince your founders to say, look, don't leave me now, especially if you're not the technical founder who has all the code in their head who can basically is the reason the thing is still moving forward or not. If that person leaves, your ability to innovate or fix the company goes way down. So what you want there is, in my mind, as much equality and as much of a sense that you're in the same boat as humanly possible. Because as soon as the fighting starts, you don't want someone who feels like, wow, this guy has one share more than me. So he's doing better. He has a different deal than me. You want to avoid that at as many costs as you can. So my view is unless there's some extreme reason, 
maybe put in $150,000 and somebody else is working part time, I could, you know, you can get into it. But broadly speaking, equal is better, simpler, easier, drives better morale. And morale is awesome and important for company building. All right. If you're into startups like I am and you spend all your time around it, you, you'll hear when I started my first company and didn't know as much about this. All these kind of words were words that people said I needed to pay real attention to. HTML5 versus native apps, which is basically ways to build mobile, mobile apps. Um, going into stealth versus not going into stealth. Um, having uh, a lean startup mentality versus using Scrum. All these kind of methodologies, people will say, you've got to do it this way or you're wrong. And at the same time, I could also go through examples of companies that have done it diametrically different. Some that say, oh, it's all about revenue from day one, Airbnb. Um, there are others where it was like never about revenue. Google from day one, right? They found out revenue. They burned a lot of money before they got to revenue. And people, you know, Facebook two years ago, people were like, Facebook's never going to make any money. Well, those people were, those, pe those prognosticators were idiots. Um, the point is there are lots of different ways to get this stuff done. And the most important thing in my mind is just absorb all the different ways to do it. Listen to people you trust and use what works. Um, but the key is to work fast, get stuff done, and be economical about it. The other point to this that you learn when you're actually working on companies, and this was really true on the legal side with companies I started, was as long as you were moving really fast and when you were early, it was hard to make any decisions that were too stupid or too bad that you couldn't undo them really quickly. So you'd learn. There was only one which was um, like filing an 83B on time. If you don't do that, like your lawyers are going to call you and be like, Dude, you really screwed that up, and you, it costs a lot of money. It's a total disaster. But other than that, there are very few things you can you can screw up too much. And my advice to, to lawyers that are advising people is to tell people, like, look, go make decisions and figure it out and, you know, get your 83B filed. But beyond that, um, just work fast. The other piece I'd say to people is um, get used to no. Whether you're founding a company or advising founders, get used to, to people saying no. When I was founding companies and, and um, trying to pitch for investment, I heard no, I think, at least 150 times on five uh, with the distinction of on five different countries. Um, as an investor, I say no a lot to founders. Probably 1% get to yes with me. And I don't think I'm, I'm not that stingy. Um, I think the averages are, are basically, I think my numbers are on average. And I think that... Um, the thing that, that's weird to me about it is how few founders actually like fall, like understand that no is just de rigueur, it's the status quo. So it's not like I don't like you, it's not like I don't want to have a relationship, it's not that I think you're stupid, it's that it's not a fit for whatever reason. And um, founders need to be resourceful, entrepreneurs need to be able to make something out of nothing, that's kind of the, the definition of what it is they do. And so I would encourage founders and if you're doing it or advising them that, you know, following up and staying after the, the person that you, you're working with is really, really important um, because, uh, you know, I can't tell you how many there's like probably about 10 percent of the founders that I interact with will keep me updated. Like once every three months, hey, Jay, here's what I've been up to. Let me tell you about the product, how it's moving. And what's good about that is while I might not invest in this opportunity now, two years from now, they might be in a different idea that I find really interesting. And having had a relationship and built it makes it a lot easier for that person to secure investment. Um, that's, I think, a better way to go than to like get offended and worry that, that I, I don't like you because I said no. So my lesson that I give to founders is deal with, figure out how you're going to deal with people saying no to you. So for me, when people would call me up and say, well, Jay, you know, we decided we're not going to invest in your awesome idea. I would like hang up the phone, like, or if it was a voicemail, I'd delete it and then like go to the gym and just be like, I need an hour to like exercise because that would like not have me distracted at how painful it is to have people saying no to you all the time. All right. Lesson six, hiring slow. So, um, my feedback in terms of employing people is wait until you get some real pain in a company have everyone interview, share the feedback, um, reference checking, very important. Um, I have had, when I worked at Microsoft, our legal department there hated the fact that we want, I wanted to do reference checks. And I was like, that seems to me like mission critical. So I would, I would push back on, on that. And then dinner with the SO is basically a significant other. Basically the recommendation there is if you're in a position where you're hiring someone, at a startup, the reality is, like, not only is it super important that they're a great functional fit for what it is you need, it's also critically important that they fit relatively well within your culture. 
And, um, you know, I've seen this time and again where startups are very unforgiving places, whereas at Microsoft, it was the kind of place where if you didn't work in marketing, for example, you could, unless you were completely incompetent or dis, you know, dishonest, you could probably find a job in a number of other places and sort of, you know, see if that's a better fit and you'd move around for years. Startups, you don't have that. You have zero degrees of freedom. If you're not a fit functionally, you're out. If you're not a fit culturally, you're probably also out because you only have like 10 people. And if they're all like, I can't stand that person, it is a total drain on productivity. So the dinner with significant other is the idea, the principle of saying, look, when you're all done with interviewing somebody or you say, look, we've done all the functional evaluations, we've done the reference checks before we make an offer. I, and in my case, my wife, but whoever is close to you want to take you and boyfriend, girlfriend, wife, husband out to dinner, totally socially. The reason for that is twofold. One, your significant other is going to get a whole lot of data on the interplay between the two of them as to what, what's going on. And two, you're going to see him or her, the candidate, in an environment where their guard's going to be down. Because one, they're going to be with a significant other, and two, they're going to feel like it's not really an interview. But that turns out to be a great way to assess, like, what's going to happen when we bring this person in? Are they, are they rude to their spouse? That would be good data to know before you hired them, for example. You know, stuff like that. Very, very important. On the firing fast, as soon as um, this is, um, you know, if you go into the, the, the world of advising startups as a lawyer, um, I think this is actually really relevant, which is to say that if a founder, especially first or second time founders who are early in their career and so haven't done it a lot, if they feel as though performance isn't sort of there, they'll often kind of uh, meander to it. They won't feel like super excited about, I don't really want to fire my co-founder. I don't want to fire this person. I want to sort of pussyfoot around it. And the advice really has to be, look, you've got to cut that out immediately because um, you just, you don't have, the degrees of freedom aren't there. It can be so corrosive to a company if you have someone that isn't pulling their weight, given that you're asking other people to take slave wages, you're asking them to work, you know, without holidays, under very bad circumstances. So you've got to encourage them to speak up uh, set very clear expectations, set crisp timelines, and then fire and making sure your, your legal counsel is involved and that all the paperwork is uh, signed before. Um, within the last year, for example, we had someone that um, was let go very suddenly at one of my companies. And the real, the real surprise was um, the founders had, they were a little loosey-goosey going into it. So they had, they were like not quite sure they had the employee uh, invention assignment agreements and all that stuff sort of signed before they'd fired the guy. So thankfully, you know, almost by accident, he signed it sort of on his way out. But if we hadn't had that, like all the IP he'd created, the company wouldn't have owned. It would have been a total debacle. So as law students, make sure that, you know, on the on the employment and getting people into the company, your stickler is about making sure that the, the HR function, whoever runs it, is getting after getting all the paperwork taken care of. Um, startups, this is a message for these guys, for the ones that I see, if you're ad all advising startups or thinking about starting one, to me, distribution is by far in the web space and the mobile space, the weakest story that anyone has. It just, it's really, really hard. And the idea, the principle is, you know, you've got 500,000 apps in the app store on iTunes uh, growing by crazy numbers every day. And with uh, Apple's recent earnings announcement, you're going to have a whole surge of new apps coming in. So how you get discovered, how you become a brand that people care about and want to know, very, very hard. If you're on the consumer internet, you've got like exponentially more places that you could go. So how do you become one of the eight sort of live tabs within your Chrome browser? How you become something that people actually know and care about is really, really hard. And it can be very difficult for you know, early founders that are technologists to think, well, I'm going to build this awesome technology. Then I'll let people like it on Facebook and tweet about it. And then I'll have distribution. It just, it does not work that way. And so one piece I really try and encourage people to think about is how are you going to drive uh, distribution? Because it's one of your most important pieces of your business. Lesson eight, this is, this is, uh, this is actually true in startups, true in law, true in anything. Like love what you're doing or leave what you're doing. It's just that simple. It's startups are really, really hard. Any of these businesses, any career you want to go build at any kind of scale is going to be something that's going to require a ton of dedication. And if you don't enjoy it, um, you know, it's just going to be hard to stand out. 
And so with startups I've done, I have a very, you know, what drove me to venture was I had my, the a venture firm that was really good. What drove me to Blue Run was Blue Run and I had become really good friends over time while I was running my business. And we'd moved the company to Asia. So I had a little bandwidth. They asked me to do some work part-time for them. And I loved it so much that I basically just made the decision. I'm going to find a way to infect myself into this firm so much that I'm indispensable. And that's basically the approach I took. So my counsel there is to start up people and to people around them. You better love it or find a, find a, different, a different line of work. <sighs> Value systems and startups. So people often tell me, geez, I don't want to talk about the values of my company. I've got three people and it's, you know, I don't want to do something that corporate. That sounds like something Microsoft would do. I take the view that it's really important from day one because it helps. Again, it's kind of similar to my principles around how to think about splitting up equity Having values is really important when times are tough and you can say, look, you know, we care about these three to five things and it helps ground people in times when things are uncertain. So I think it's important to set them. I think it's important to talk about them constantly. And I think it's there's no right way to do. There's no right set of values, but it's important for every company to really think about what they are and make them happen. Make sure everyone knows them. All right, lesson 10. This turns to a little bit on the venture world and fundraising. This is one of our conference rooms. Um, it's one of our smaller ones. These are like video, these are video panels that actually enable us to talk to other people if they do it remotely. But this is basically what you do in venture capital meetings. You go into a room like this and talk for an hour and hope somebody like gives you a check at the end of the time. <laughs> so my logistics are as much as you can, arrive early, 15 minutes, have backups, second PCs. Uh, dongles to plug stuff in if things aren't working, um, a USB stick with the presentation, and treat everyone you interact with nicely. Um, I was um, visiting Food Spotting for a board meeting last week in San Francisco, and I got a call coming out of the meeting from my secretary saying basically my next meeting back down in the peninsula had been like so rude to her that she was like telling him, telling the guy I was out of the office and had to take a call as opposed to meeting him because she was just like the guy's a turkey, and. You know, it, it made it a non-starter in terms of an evaluation of the business because, the, you know, my, my philosophy is if I'm going to write you a check, then it's my, my name's on the line to help make you successful in any way I can. And very likely I'm going to be spending five years of my life working with you to try and get your idea into something that's viable. And the last thing I really want to do is do that with somebody that I don't enjoy spending time with. Um, it's pre-flight. You're getting the PowerPoint up and running. Get the demo up and running beforehand. Um, there's nothing sort of more difficult than sort of being, you know, having, giving people a big build up and saying, let me show you my demo and then waiting five minutes for the demo to sort of work while it tries to figure out where's the internet and the SQL server gets restarted or whatever it is. Get that stuff set up before you start and ideally bring two to three, more than one and, and less than four people. And I'll talk about that very specifically in a minute. All right. So during a meeting, you're going to have two to three people. You're going to want to advise people to say, you know, everybody has a role, meaning you get slides one, three, and seven, you get all the others, and here's how it's going to split up. You don't want to have the sort of pop fly idea of, well, I'm done with this slide and don't feel like taking the next slide. Why don't you take the next slide? It just looks really disorganized. Figure out who's doing what and give them a role. Whoever is not talking should be um, scribing every time, and there, I'll talk about this in a minute. Um, the reason the scribe, what the scribe does is they sit there and any time a venture capitalist or investor asks a question, the scribe writes down the question. And the reason you do that is very quickly after you talk to three or four venture capitalists, you're going to realize about 85% of the questions are exactly the same. And instead of acting like it's the first time you've ever heard that question, wouldn't it be nice that after the first time somebody asks you, how are you going to compete with Google or how, or how much money are you raising? You had a really crisp, tight answer that said, here's my answer to that question. Um, and QA is actually really important. I'd say many businesses where you'd say, hey, this is really reasonable. I think it's really interesting. I want to probe. You start asking questions and then badly handled Q&A can really lose the day where you're like, oh, man, I can just tell that founder and that founder not on the same page. Or I bet that founder is totally screwing that founder out of equity. Or I bet something bad is happening. And so my, my point is, script out the obvious questions you're going to get. These are the obvious questions you're going to get. And the questions that aren't obvious, you're going to get asked in the first two meetings you have and have somebody write them down and then afterwards talk about and figure out how you're going to answer them and what you're going to say. Post-meeting, right, I've already talked about that. Follow up with an email that day with thanks. Expect to get told no. And stay in touch with people. 
you know, again, so many, so few founders ever sort of ping me and sort of keep me up to date. And I'm always happy to sort of get reconnected with people, irrespective of, broadly speaking, there are a couple that, that I would be fine to ignore, but basically. <laughs> All right, so shifting out of that into getting jobs in venture, and then I'll talk about legal, and then I'll, then I'll be done, and I should have a few minutes for questions. Um, I often get asked by people, you know, how do you get into venture? Can I do an internship? Would you, you guys hire associates? Um, and I'll talk broadly about the venture industry. And what I would say is, first and foremost, there's no clear career path into it. So you see a variety of modes that work. Some have associate programs where you sort of jump in, and then you, you sort of climb the ladder uh, you know, up to principal and then up to partner. Um, others have, you know, pull entrepreneurs in that they've worked with. Um, there's all kinds, some will pull them from industry. You know, Colin Powell's a partner at Kleiner Perkins, so you know you could go be Secretary of State too, I guess. <laughs> um, so the thing to me is it, the reason for that is these things are really small private partnerships, so they're very bespoke cultures. The egos that are in place there all have their own sort of ways of doing things, and they're going to be looking for specific assets and ways to sort of to sort of add to that culture, and that's going to be dependent as well on stage of their fund. Like, do they have money to invest? Are they feeling compressed in terms of deal flow, whatever it is? And so, um, you know, with that in mind, my basic advice to people that are asking me to, you know, how do you get into venture is to figure out how can you add value to venture capitalists. So from in my case, for example, um, I had started by just being friends with the, the, the founding partners of, of Blue Run. And over time, they would send me deals that they were looking at and they'd ask for advice and I'd ask for advice and that, or I'd give them advice uh, for free. And then I started sending them deals. And over the course of about six months, there were two deals that we were doing that were competitive deals that we very much wanted to win. And I basically sold Blue Run as to the founders as, look, this is the firm you want to deal with and help them get comfortable with our offer. And at the end of that negotiation, it just made all the sense in the world for me to, to sort of represent Blue Run on the board of those companies. And so that was basically how that transition occurred. And if you step back from it, from sort of that specific case of sort of how I did it uh, and think about what's important in terms of adding value, it's basically uh, these four things. The first is, you know, having access to deals is, is probably the single biggest piece of currency you have as a venture capitalist. Can you find deals that other people can't get access to? The second is, do founders trust and respect you? So, um, you know, one of the things that I talk, I'm actually re have a relatively negative bias against starting in venture capital in the associate ranks, simply because um, if you're working with early stage companies where the founders are coming in, founders want people that really understand what they walked, they've walked a mile in their shoes and they understand kind of how hard it is and they have some sympathy and can give them real concrete advice. But if you've basically just gone in as an associate, a, a founder, is general, especially a good one, is going to have a very strong bias against saying, does this person really have any value to me? Or are they just a gatekeeper to someone who actually can make decisions or do something for me? <coughs> so having uh, had, again, 10 years of experience, having worked at Microsoft, having started my own companies, having had a lot of, um, taught a lot of seminars on branding, naming, business models, revenue, all that stuff enabled founders when they work with me to say, wow, Jay has access to people that can help, uh, that I can hire. He has access to knowledge that I like. So that trust and respect came through. Then closing business, closing deals, getting to a place where you found a great deal, you've earned their trust, but then saying, okay, look, Blue Run is going to invest in this company and getting that closed, winning that business, winning good business, very, very critical. And then finally, showcasing that you're a really good, strong team player is something that I think is really important because, again, it's a small, bespoke culture. And if, um, if you don't fit, kind of like what I was saying with startups, you're going to get bounced out because people just don't like working with you and they have the, the ability to work with whoever they want. <sighs> Thoughts on legal. So these are four legal – these are lawyers who are now startup people. So there's Michael Arrington, who you may know from Crunch, uh, TechCrunch, now Uncrunched, and the – Crunched Fund. Matthew Prince is a fantastic founder who is a lawyer and computer scientist, but a lawyer who has started a, a company that's, I believe, called Cloudflare. Very, very fast growing, very successful company and extremely smart guy. Chris Sacco was in legal affairs and regulatory affairs at Google, then became um, one of the early investors of Twitter and a bunch of other companies and now runs a very prominent uh, venture capital and later stage private equity fund. 
David Hornick is a Harvard uh, Law School grad who now is a partner at August Capital and has done a variety of very, very strong investments. So I guess this slide is basically just to say if, uh, if you're getting a law degree and you're thinking high tech and the high tech environment and community is something you want to engage in either as a lawyer or, or as uh, a professional in another field, I would say one of the unique and interesting things that I find about Silicon Valley is it's a place that really doesn't care that much where you came from. Um, what it cares about is, are you smart? Do you work hard? Can you get interesting things done? And it tends to be very merit meritocratic in that way. And you see examples of people that you'd say, well, okay, you know, how does a law degree uh, drive the relevance within the technology community? And I, I would say, you know, you got to answer that on your own, but um, there are examples, clear examples of successful people that have made transitions into interesting things beyond um, working in, you know, like Wilson Sonsini or something of that nature. These are the, just the concrete thoughts that I had around thoughts on legal. If you were advising early stage companies, this is something Jamal asked me to think about. Um, this is sort of when you're representing a company or when you're representing a venture firm, what are like the most important things that you have to do as a lawyer or keep track of? To me, by far the most important is board composition. Who sits on the board and how does it, how do the seats work? Um, startups, as I've described, are extremely dynamic places. You'll have people leave, people get fired. You'll have very tenuous, you know, challenges. They can be um, they can be really dynamic. And so, figuring out whose interests get protected and how, whether it's you know founders control seats, common stock control seats, preferred controlling seats, and and how that works is very, very important to keep track of and to watch as a company evolves because in the, in the heat of things being dynamic, you want to be sure that the investors and founders, whoever you're representing, have the right kind of ongoing representation. The second is ensuring that all the employee contracts and the assignments of invention of IP and so on are handled and dealt with on time and well. Very critical. Nothing more frustrating than worrying about um, you know, someone leaving the company without having all that paperwork nailed. Um, liquidation preferences and rights, these come about as a function of um, financings, and it basically just means who gets what money when the company is sold. Um, and depending on which side of the company you're on and who cares for what, um, making sure you're representing and explaining that to clients is really important. This is very important for founders to track. Um, you know, my own view and editorial on that is, um, you know, founders should be, if you're representing founders, um, founders should be demanding very generous, you know, a generous stance towards them on liquidation preferences with the principle that um, basically it, our philosophy is if the founders aren't extremely ex economically incented to get rich based on working all the time, then we're putting our we're putting our mo it's like bad money. We're putting good money after bad is kind of how I would think about it. You want to have the incentives of the, of the founders extremely aligned towards yours. And by do you, to do that. You've got to give that you can't be sort of li putting liquidation preferences and rights on top of a financing that makes it virtually impossible for them to make money. If you do that, they're going to leave and then your money has just been sunk down a hole. Um, the other question I got asked about is how do you attract clients? Um, same thing with in the venture world. My feedback is, you know, you got to get out there. Um, you got to be in Silicon Valley and meet people. You've got to build presence. I, I work with a guy named Yoakum Taku a lot, personally and professionally. He's at Wilson Sonsini, and he's um, uh, the writer of this thing called Startup Company Lawyer, which basically gives away a lot of free legal advice um, to, to founders around liquidation preferences and board composition and all this stuff. But he also is just relentless as a networker, and he'll take on clients for free on the promise that if they, those com companies get anywhere, he'll have the inside track in terms of being able to make that happen or being able to get their ongoing business. Um, so that's really what I've got. I think that's the end of my talk. I don't know. My last is these are, and I'm happy to share this deck. I'd be happy to, well, you've you also got a film of it, but these are, if you're interested in startups, all these links here, if you click through to them are the resources that I think that I found the most valuable TechCrunch, VentureBeat and so on. Those are just news sources. You should be aware of them. Joel on software is a great blog written by a guy named Joel, I think Spolsky, who is, um, uh, a great writer about building technology companies and provides very concrete, useful advice. Startups Lessons Learned is Eric Reese's um, blog about the lean startup. Startup Digest, if you're ever out in Silicon Valley or you know, and you want to know what's going on there in startups, Startup Digest is basically a list every week of what are the events happening in startups. 
Netflix on culture, a great discussion of culture. CompStudy.com is a place to go, which basically is an annual survey of compensation, equity, and bonus packages by stage, revenue level of companies. So it can be very helpful in negotiating startup packages for compensation. If you need to name a brand, a company, the Igor Naming Guide is great. And Paul Graham's blog is just awesome in terms of company building. And that's what I've got. Thanks. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them for a few minutes. Yep. I guess a key one for a lot of people who want to work on a startup is which is finding the technical founder. And we've at a point where we're looking at two different teams that are bidding on it to build the site. And we know that you know dumping thousands of dollars into someone building your site as opposed to having someone officially a part of a team are two very different things. What would you suggest in terms of trying to locate that technical founder? Yeah, so I mean there's it's kind of that like that uh, quote of you know, <laughs> There's the, you go to a war with the army you got, not the army you wish you had. And so there's a constant tension point in terms of, you know, and I talk to startups all the time that struggle with this. And so you have to make the hard decision around, um, you know, is it worth it to have something to go build and be able to show progress, you know, in terms of being able to attract customers, get feedback, iterate? That by far is the most important thing is can, how can you shrink the time that it's going to take you to figure out what is you know, is our product meeting what a customer wants? Figuring that out is by far the most critical. And if you don't have that, nothing else really matters. So the decision of hire some, you know, continue to look or spend money should be framed in, you know, how much more quickly will we be able to gauge customer market fit and order? The the core of your question is how to go find somebody. I mean, that's a that's I mean, one of you know 50 questions you're gonna have, which are those catch 22s of if you don't have the money or the you know the, the sort of credibility or whatever it is, how do you attract someone? You've got sort of you've got to be able to do it. And you know, tips and tricks I would have on that would be to you know basically spend a lot of time in the computer science department. I mean, as long as you're down here and you've got kids that are running around you know coding all day, see if you can attract somebody that way. Um, in, in in a place like where I spend most of my time, like in Northern California. You'll have, you know, you encourage people to do meetups. You encourage people to, you know, use ladders.com, which is like usually more high-end uh, recruiters, and you can usually get or high-end people apply for jobs on that, and you can usually sort of get a couple free trials and stuff like that, and start doing online recruiting things of that nature. But that stuff can be really hard and really hit or miss. My preference would be to just network as much as you can here in the location that you are, and just try and find people and branch out, you know, just work. Um, to find whoever you can either at the school or in the area. Um, but then beyond that, I think it becomes very important to try and figure out, okay, is this the location you're gonna build the company? And if you're gonna build a technical, if you're gonna do a technical co-founder, you're gonna to wanna to very quickly get to the location that you're gonna end up being in. All right, thank you. You're welcome. All right, any other, uh, want, yeah? Two entrepreneurs in the room asked the question. Great, awesome. <laughs> Um, so you had talked about you build out as much as you can, the first slides, right? Yeah. And have some sort of market. Most of the things that I'm seeing built right now are just bolt-ons or modifications of existing ideas. Are you seeing real big ideas out there? Because uh, I don't. Well, uh, so when I talk about markets being the most important thing, yep. I would say that... Um, Again, you know, we're making, I'm making two, if I make two investments a year, like that's decent, I'd like to make more. Sure. So, and I'm seeing 75 a quarter. So the answer is basically, the reason I say no most often is, again, I, I'd said it earlier, that most of the time the, the reason is, look, I think the idea is really incremental. Mm -hmm. And even if you achieved what you said you, you were doing, I wouldn't really care. I mean, it wouldn't make the world that much better a place. Right. So it's definitely few and far between. And, and, um, but at the same time, we aspire to find things that are, are that do that. Okay. Awesome. Okay, last question because I want to let people go on time. Sure. Uh, so, um, I guess one of the companies that you talked about investing in is this uh, company that 
um, uh, like helps people pick uh, dishes or like uh, yeah. uh, figure out which dishes are good in the neighborhood. So, uh, what's the um, what's the benefit of this like rising trend of like mini social networks where um, uh, you know you have the big established players like Facebook and Yelp and it, like if they if they make the same idea then they'll wipe out um, uh, this uh, this smaller company that's doing like yeah. uh, their like little mini social yeah. uh, network that you know has pretty high barriers to entry because people need to you know download the app or uh, join the network or what have you so like what's the what's the value out of having the smaller uh, the smaller yeah so I have two routes to answer that the first is I think where it's sort of some will say well you've got Facebook you've got Twitter and there's no need for anything else in social I believe that I have a different view which is I believe we're kind of like in the same way in 1979 you had three TV channels and now we have like 500 of them we're kind of in a place where in 10 years you're going to have, you know, I'm going to interact with PATH and I'm going to interact with Twitter. I'm going to interact with different things based on what it is that I want to sort of access to, what circle of friends, whatever it is. So I don't believe that we're sort of in a place where we're done by any stretch. That's sort of vector one. Vector two, though, is I think mobile presents a whole different set of use cases because the form factors are so much smaller that says, like Yelp, Yelp, like, when you look at Yelp, the mobile app, it's it's totally fine and it's good, but it's it has no, I mean, it's like stars and you got a bunch of crappy reviews and it's basically a big website shrunk down to a small screen. So what I would say is most of the existing players that exist in the world today, Yelp being a great example, exist on a big form factor and shrinking them down to a small screen is okay, but it's kind of like this kind of Frankenstein version of the, the <laughs> web app. It's, it's not as fun, it's not as interesting, it's not as social, it's not as visual. And what, what, what we were attracted by food spotting was it was built from the ground up to be mobile. So when you open it up and it says, here's the food that's near you, you get these gorgeous high-res pictures put in front of you. You're like, oh, wow, I want to eat that. And then you sort of drill in. So it's a different way, way to do that. And then you have to ask yourself the question, how easy is it for Yelp to sort of pivot, to sort of match that? And my assessment is... I don't, you know, Yelp also covers plumbers and it covers like electricians and, and you're not going to be able to sort of create that same kind of emotional experience. So I felt as though mobile creates more of a disruptive experience opportunity because, if it, you know, it's kind of like you've got so much surface area on a PC screen and it's very hard to nail design on, on mobile. And so what I think we're starting to see is companies that are doing mobile will say, hey, I'm going to do this little twist on the business and I'm going to be able to create a... Create an, create an opportunity. I mean, by the time we'd invested in food spotting, they had, you know, they'd been out for three months, they had like 600,000 users, they were just off on a tear. So we were kind of like, you know, this is, and we thought, and the thing that was crazy about it was the community just loved them. The people that used it were really passionate about it, and they were, and we felt like, okay, this is something that could be different than Yelp. And now Yelp is, I mean, they're probably a direct competitor. I don't want to put them down. They're public. They're, they're an awesome company, all that sort of stuff. Um, but it just seems to me that mobile is such a fast-growing environment and it requires such a different type of development that incumbents are disruptable in this environment. So that was basically the approach we took. With that, I'm going to close out. Uh, I'm I think I'm around for like five minutes. But anyway, thank you guys very much for taking lunch and joining me. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.